Let's go, break it down, put it there, bring it on, step it up, right there, break it down, put it there, here we go, step it up, bring it on, let's go. Yes, welcome everyone to the live program of Studium Generale. We are on air again and uh, you can comment to this program live in the chat on Facebook and on YouTube, of course, in the comments. And uh, today we have a prelude to the famous Dutch Design Week. The Dutch Design Week is this year again, and it starts this uh, this Saturday with an online program. And uh, the Studium Generale program is a part of this Dutch Design Week in, in, in a way, because we are presenting a story that is related to the Drives of Change exhibition that is part of the Dutch Design Week. Unfortunately, it isn't uh, to be visited in uh, Atlas as we had planned, but it is all online. And all online, you can see um, many of the projects that we would have presented live, and uh, they can be explored via films and uh, also via chats with the designers. And we have online tours, and we, saw, we have also a program of online uh, stories of change in the evenings starting from the 19th of October. So that will be a wonderful week. And uh, as a prelude to this, we have invited Professor Peter Baltus. He is a professor in high frequency electronics at the Department of Electrical Engineering. And he will tell us a lot about a very famous and very interesting phenomenon smart marbles little marbles that can uh, visit places that uh, are inaccessible uh, in other situations and um, without further ado i would like to give a warm round of, round of applause here is peter baltus thank you very much lucas and thank you for the opportunity to talk about my work and my hobby um, welcome everybody Today, we are going to talk about the science and the practice of exploration. Exploration is very human. People already for centuries, for millennia, felt the need to explore, to see what's behind the horizon. And they did that depending on the, the time they lived and the technology they had available in different ways. Nowadays, exploration is very much geared, for example, towards space, because we want to find out what is beyond our Earth. But a few centuries ago, it was focused on Earth itself, trying to figure out what was beyond the horizon, what the map of the world should look like, like what you can see here. And to do that exploration, people had to solve some problems. And these problems at an abstract level are common to all kinds of exploration. So in this time, when people did this type of mapping, um, very often they used a ship. Right? So they would go uh, with a ship like, like this one, a uh, sailing ship, and they would go beyond the horizon to see what's there. Um, but immediately choosing a ship to go places gives you a lot of decisions to make. How big a ship should you take? If you take a big ship, you might not be able to go into a river that you're interested in. If you take a small ship, you might not be able to bring enough supplies to survive until you get to this river. So choosing the right kind of ship, the right size of ship is important. But unfortunately, since you're going to explore to places where you have not been yet, you don't know how wide that river is. You don't even know whether there is a river. So making that choice, what vessel to bring is a difficult choice and something that you cannot uh, make an obviously correct decision for. And that's not just when you go by ship. Also, if you explore, for example, the jungle, uh, and you go on horses, you have a similar problem. How many people, how many horses do you bring? How much food do you bring? Do you bring something to pr protect you from mosquitoes? Or maybe to protect you from alligators? People might not even know about alligators, right? They're going into an unknown place. So deciding what to bring, deciding what to buy in your local general store uh, is, is a difficult decision, something that you cannot scientifically do correctly. And this is something that you might recognize as well. Even in the modern world, we do some exploration. Most people had a little bit <coughs> a more um, limited scale, uh, for example, in this way, right? So people might take a, a caravan and, and go camping. And even then, you have the similar problem. You go to a more modern store, something like this, 
And um, you might wonder, what should I bring? Maybe where I'm going, they don't have my favorite potatoes. Maybe they don't have my favorite beer. Maybe I need uh, sunshades. You don't know, because you have not been there. You're exploring. And you don't know what to bring. <clears throat> my apologies. So most people, they solve that by bringing as much as they can until the caravan and the car is overloaded. Even then, very often, and you might recognize this from your own vacation, when you arrive, you might find out that you forgot something that is really important. Your toothbrush or bringing warm clothes or whatever is needed for the environment where you're in. So this brings us to a, a very fundamental question for all kinds of explorations, and that's the, the chicken and egg question. Right? If you really want to do good exploration, if you want to be successful, you need to know the thing that you're going to explore because that will help you decide what to bring. But in order to know that, you need to explore. And that means that there is no simple solution for this. And that problem exists for all kinds of exploration. That also exists for exploration that we are interested in as applications in today's modern world. For example, this is the inside of a nuclear reactor. Sometimes things go wrong. Fortunately, very seldom, but it happens. And then you really want to know what's going on in there. But if you try to find out and you ask for volunteers, you will find that there are very few people volunteering to go into a nuclear reactor that is, uh, just had a mishap. So you bring in sensors, some form or another. But these sensors, for example, attached to a robot, um, you don't know how big they can be, right? Because they might have to fit through small openings or they might have to climb really large pieces of concrete. Um, you don't know how much battery uh, power to take. Is it enough to go for one hour, for two hours? You don't know whether your sensors will get stuck. Maybe you need more, but then they become bigger and they might not fit. Very similar problem as we had with these sailing ships. Very similar problem as people had that were uh, exploring the jungle. Very similar problem to what people have if they go on vacation. Also, um, if you're a doctor, right, and you're talking to a patient, and the patient, something is wrong with the patient, and you want to discover what's wrong, you would like to explore what's inside that patient. Opening up a patient is a possibility, but usually um, it's costly and not very comfortable and something you want to postpone as much as possible. So you could put sensors in a person, sounds and, and uh, things like that. But if you don't know what you're looking for, if the situation that uh, the, the patient has is very unclear, you don't know whether you're looking for a tumor or you don't know whether you're looking for a specific virus or you don't know whether you're looking maybe for a specific kind of acid, then what are you going to put in that patient? Or yet another example, um, in many of our cities and our countries, we have pipes, underground pipes for gas, still, for water, for uh, sewers and so on. And often, something goes wrong with these, these pipes and it's hard to find out, right? They, they might leak, they might get obstructed. And um, the way to find out nowadays is very often like this. You just dig it up. But digging up a pipe is expensive, especially if you don't know exactly what to look for and where to look. Because the documentation of pipes is not always perfect to, I, I've learned over the last years. So what do you do? It would be nice to have sensors in these, in these pipes but again, how big a sensor can you afford to have in there? How much battery lifetime do you need? What are you going to measure? Um, and, and these problems that I mentioned, they are very relevant for our society. Because, for example, just the pipes. One province in the Netherlands every year spends, <coughs> on average, more money digging up pipes without knowing whether it's really needed than we spend on the whole research project that I'm telling you about today. So if we could solve that problem, if we could solve that chicken and egg problem in an elegant way so that we could use sensors to find answers in a very cheap and reliable way to the questions that we have without having to open up patients or nuclear reactor or pipes, and there's many other similar applications like this, then that would be very, very useful for many applications. So how do we do that? Well, if we find such a, a common question among a number of application areas and we think there's high societal relevance, then as a scientist the obvious thing to do is first you find a number of people you know, 
that have the knowledge that is required to, to do this kind of investigation. And then, of course, the next thing you need is you need money. And so what you do is you write a project proposal. And that's how we got to the Phoenix project. The Phoenix project is a European project, European funded project uh, that involved 12 researchers across seven organizations, research organizations in Europe that together works on solving this generic problem of optimizing a sensor to explore an unknown environment. So how did we do that? Well, first we got an idea of the sensor. Right? And the sensor, we figured out, it needs to do a number of basic things. It needs to be able to do measurements um, of all kinds of parameters. And we don't know the parameters yet. So the measurements need to be very flexible. We need to be able to configure it to measure different kinds of things. Maybe sometimes the temperature, sometimes the pressure, acceleration, uh, acceleration rotation, um, magnetic fields, uh, sounds, light. We don't know yet, but we should be able to configure it to, to measure what's needed. We also need something to communicate and to uh, allow, allow the sensor to find its location, because very often it's not just required that you know that you, for example, measured that there is a leak or there is radiation. You also want to know where. So you also need something that allows you to communicate and to localize uh, the, the sensor itself. And then you need some part to store your observations and to steer the whole machine. Uh, we call that instincts. Basically, what we're saying is there should be something that allows the sensor to react to its environment. And for example, when it's observed something that's potentially interesting, to take more measurements. Right? That could be one instinct. Or when the battery is very low, to reduce the number of samples it takes. So there's some kind of low level intelligence that um, steers the whole sensing part. Okay, so we have a, a general idea now of what such a sensor should look like. Well, on a block diagram. Physically, it looks like this, right? It's a, a sphere. And that can be of different sizes. And again, we have the same question that we had with the, the sailing, sailing ships, with the, the, the caravan and with the horses, right? How big can it be? Well, the basic question here is, do we want to build one super sensor that can do everything? Or do we want to make multiple sensors that together solve the problem? You can go both ways. The super sensor is attractive because you have everything confined in one piece of hardware and software and everything is perfectly coordinated and optimized. But it needs to be big because you need to fit all these functionalities inside of a sensor. And very often uh, related to that, if you want to do all these things, all these things take energy. And that means that you also need a large battery. And that's how you end up with sensors roughly this size. You can also go the other direction and say, well, you know, if I want so much, but maybe the sensor is going to be so big that I can't honestly ask a patient to swallow this to find out what's wrong with him. Right? Because if a patient would swallow this, then we would know what's wrong with him or her. Um, would be very unhealthy. So what, what do you do then? Well, if you would break up what you need into many small sensors, and every sensor would do part of the job, then you could make the sensor very small, and you could still do all the things that you want to do. It's like splitting up um, a, a group of explorers instead of going with one big sailing ship, going with many small boats. And you could still do the same thing, but you have a lot more flexibility. So we discussed that, and in the end, we found that the advantages of this swarm approach versus uh, the uh, super sensor uh, is, in the, is in the direction of the swarm, because in the end, size matters. There are places where you just cannot go with a big sensor and a group of smaller sensors always works and you have the flexibility of uh, making the trade-off of putting in more sensors and getting more information that way and uh, you, you can tune that depending on the problem. So that makes the whole problem more manageable. It's still the same fundamental problem. We still don't know the properties of the sensors. We don't know exactly what to measure and when to measure, but at least we've gotten rid of one constraint and that's the size constraint. But we still have this fundamental question, 
how do you optimize these sensors? And now that we have so many sensors, we have many things to decide. Right? So this is the, the sensors that we experimented with. That's what's inside the, the ball that I just showed you. Um, but now we need to make decisions about how to configure this thing. So we need to decide um, how big can we make these individual sensors? How often do they need to measure? How many sensors are we going to use? How much money can we spend on one sensor? How heavy can they be? How accurate do the measurements need to be? What are we going to sense in the first place? Right? And how long does the whole experiment have to last? We really need to answer these questions to configure these sensors. And now that we have so many sensors, we need to decide that for each and every sensor up front. And we're back to a larger version of this chicken and egg problem. So how do we do that? Well, actually, we do something very similar to what most people do. It's just a simplified form of trial and error. Right? So we make something. We make some sensors that, based on common sense, on the information that we have, um, are likely to give an answer that we might be able to use. So we take a group of sensors, the, the red dots that you see here. We put them into this real world environment. We get the, grab them when they, when they come out. And then we see what they've measured. And we hope to get an answer. If we don't get an answer, at least not quite the answer that we need, at least we have some information. And we can fine tune the sensors to give better answers. And we can repeat that experiment. And that's, that works. And we can fine tune that uh, by uh, making diversification, by having different sensors do different tasks. But in principle, it's uh, the, the same approach, just more sensors. But the problem is um, that if you do it this way, it's sort of like evolution, right? You, you do um, an experiment. You find out what the outcome is. You don't quite like it. <clears throat> you change the experiment a little bit. Um, you get a different outcome. Um, it's better, but still not there. And so you look at the results. And from all the experiments, you, you look at the best results you got. And you sort of make a combination of that. Um, and then you're going to try that again. It's a little bit like evolution. right? You, you, you try many times. And you can, in fact, automate that. There are algorithms that are called artificial evolution that automate this whole process for you to decide what new experiments to do. But like real re uh, evolution, it's likely, but not guaranteed, to give a good result. And it can take a long time. Right? Uh, if you look at natural evolution, it can take a really long time. And for most of these problems, um, you want to have an answer sooner. So we need to speed up this whole process. And that's what when we came up with the, the next idea. Um, why don't we do uh, this whole process, this whole experiment in the computer? Because computers get faster all the time. You can have more computers. So you can speed up the whole process. So what we do is we do the first experiment. We make real balls. We put them in the real environment. We get measurements. And then based on these measurements, we make a model of the environment, which is not good enough yet. But it's a model. It's, it's a little bit like reality, hope we hope. And then we put that model in a computer. And we simulate uh, these sensors in that environment. And then we, we start optimizing the sensors in this simulation over and over and over again. And we can do that much faster than in reality. We can do maybe 1,000 experiments in an hour or in a day, where um, in reality, we, we probably would take more than one day for one experiment. So it really speeds up things a lot. But of course, we still suffer from the fact that our models are not perfect. Right? Our models are based on the measurements uh, from the sensors, but the sensors are not doing the right measurements <coughs> because they have not been optimized. So the, the, the problem still is there. And if we don't do anything, then we get sensors that are very much optimized for the wrong environment. So once in a while, we have to calibrate against reality. And that's when you get a double loop. You have this outer loop with the green arrows, where you do an experiment going with real sensor balls through reality, getting real data. Then in the upper green box, the simulation environment, you build a new model. You optimize in the simulation and in, in software, in the computer, um, the behavior of these, these sensors, make them better and better and better. And you do that maybe a thousand times or 10,000 times. And then when you think they're as good as you're going to get them, um, you're going to make the real balls again to match whatever came out of that computer environment. 
and you do another experiment through the real world and you get a much better uh, idea of what's happening, what, what you are looking at inside uh, the, the inex uh, inaccessible environment. And you use that information to update the model in your computer and do it again and again. And with this double loop, you have the advantage that you can iteratively, but very quickly, get to a solution that allows you to have optimized sensor balls and very accurate uh, exploration of environments where you don't have access to. So that's really nice. And we, we've done this um, and we, we build this, both the software and the hardware. And um, then for experiments, we build a, a setup uh, like this where we have a lot of pipes. And that's also something that uh, you're going to see in uh, the Dutch Design Week uh, virtual setup. Um, a very similar setup where we actually can put in these sensor balls and we can do experiments and we have the advantage that we know what's inside because we are smart enough to make the pipes transparent. And then we can see uh, whether the information we get from the system of dual loop optimization of sensor balls, whether that really gives correct answers. And to just show you what it looks like in reality, I have a, a small movie where you can see uh, some of our students actually working on these experiments with these pipes and, and these balls. And you can see that um, science can also be a lot of fun, right? The, the students had a, a lot of fun with uh, splashing water and throwing in balls and getting them out again. And um, we had uh, even some small accidents where the whole lab uh, was uh, flooded. But um, we learned from it. It's good science. And at the same time, it's a lot of fun. So. With this setup, we did experiments and we found that indeed things were working. We could demonstrate that the principle works. We can efficiently explore inaccessible unknown environments and we can very quickly optimize flexible sensor balls to explore such environments. So that's really nice. And we are now uh, extending that to uh, uh, more realistic uh, scenarios and we find new problems because in, in real world, for example, uh, one of the things we found that the pipes are very often not transparent and they're much longer and they're buried. And so sometimes we lose balls and we don't know what happened to them and things like that. So we learn from that as well. So that research is continuing and there's a group of applications where this size ball is perfectly appropriate and where we can already make people quite happy um, with the technology that we have once we get these small practical things worked out. But remember, we were also interested in making this very small because um, that makes the, the range of applications that you can address much larger. And also from a scientific point of view, it's very interesting because it makes the available resources in a ball much smaller. Right? So then the question is, how small can you make it? How optimally can you configure something that has a very tiny battery, very limited sensors to still do what you need? The need for optimization becomes a lot bigger if you make really small sensors. And so we also in this, in this Phoenix project, we really want to go to, uh, to the limits of what's possible. And so some of the researchers worked on miniaturizing this electronics, but also at the same time, making it very flexible so that we could configure it to do all kinds of measurements and also reducing the power dissipation that's required to operate. So I'm going to show you uh, a few uh, pictures of, uh, of, of uh, these sensors and electronics. Um, you don't have to fully understand them. Just look at them as, as nice abstract paintings. Uh, they look a little bit like this. The interesting thing to see though is how small they are. So this is about, um, well, about this size. And um, yeah, that's a little bit hard for you to see. So I'm going to walk around uh, this now and to try and show it to you uh, from really close by. And you might be able to see, well, down there, a very tiny silver speck. And that's actually the size of the electronics we're talking about. Quite a large reduction from this thing. Uh, this chip actually is doing the, the communication um, and the localization. And we also have a, a similar chip for uh, the sensing part. And you can see this one is even smaller. It's uh, 0.3 by 0.1 millimeters. And it's not just small. One thing, of course, it needs to be small because then you can make small sensors, but it also needs to be very low power. And for example, this chip is uh, as the world record for the lowest energy consumption for doing these kind of very flexible measurements. 
In fact, just to give you an idea, with this chip, we can do for the same amount of energy that you need to have a one watt LED bulb run for one second, this thing can make two billion measurements. So really, really very efficient. And that means that you can have a very tiny battery that matches the size of, uh, these, uh, of these pieces of electronics. And so what we are dreaming of, what we're working on now, is something that we don't have yet, but I have some nice artist impression uh, where we have a few of these dies connected together inside of a ball. This is what they look without the shell. And uh, we want to combine them in such a way that you can actually make them run in very large numbers inside an environment. And again, that's something we don't have yet, but also that's where artists and um, animations can help us. So in the end, this is roughly what we hope that it will look like. So this gives you some idea of where we are and where we're going. With this technology, we find that um, we set out to explore a number of applications and it looks like uh, applications such as uh, these, these uh, pipes, applications such as nuclear reactors, um, mixing vessels, a, a lot of industrial applications we can already address. There are other applications that we never thought of, but that people are very interested in and they start con uh, contacting us already um, to say, well, if you have something like this, could we also use it for this application? And I hope that as a consequence of this presentation and of the Dutch Design Week, there will be more people that come up with brilliant ideas of how to use this technology. And in parallel to that, we will work further to miniaturize this to a size where you could actually eat something with this functionality with the, without even noticing it, without being hard to swallow. So that's um, where we will be uh, going for, uh, for the next period. Of course, we don't do this just by a single person or a single researcher, right? I mean, I have the honor of telling you this, but in fact, all the work was done by this group of people. These are the researchers and their coaches that actually did all this research. And um, these are the organizations that were involved in, um, in, in this research. And of course, um, I shouldn't forget that, uh, the European Union actually funded this whole research and we are very thankful for that as well. So, I hope this gives you some idea of what we've done, what kind of technology that we have uh, worked on, what kind of basic problem that we are addressing, this, this chicken and egg problem of exploring something in an optimal way without knowing what it is. And I hope that inspires you to um, maybe new applications for this technology, and maybe also to some questions at, uh, at the end of this presentation. For now, I would like to, um, to thank you for your attention. And I think uh, there's now an opportunity for you to, to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, nice round of applause. I, uh, Thank you. I, <laughs> that's always a, a very interesting moment in the, in the presentation. First of all, my big compliments for your, the environment that you created yourself. Uh, this is really lovely to see you within your home environment presenting this uh, in a very vivid way with this background. Uh, my question was, um, uh, the first question that, uh, that I would like to, to say is, um, is there any, any sort of collaboration between the smarbles and how, how uh, yes. independent is that? Is that, a, is that an independent, uh, an autonomous system? Can you explore a little bit? Yes. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> the, the smarbles are not completely independent. Um, there, there is a benefit for them to exchange information. However, exchanging information also costs energy. Right, so we, we try to minimize the exchange of information to only that's what is absolutely necessary to do while the experiment runs. What we do is we store all the raw data in the memory of the, of the smarbles. And then when we retrieve them, we read all of that information into a computer and everything that we can do afterwards, all the communication that you can sort of po do, do in post-processing, we do in post-processing. We don't do that in the real world because then and you know, once they're out and in a real computer, that computer is connected to mains, electricity, and there's infinite amounts of power, infinite amounts of computation capacity. And so whatever we can do after the fact, we do after the fact. But there's some minimal amount of communication that we, we find we need. And there's at least two cases where you, you definitely need information exchange between, uh, between balls. One is to find the location. We find that many of these environments, there's no GPS. Right? So you, you cannot know where you are 
in the most convenient way with something like Google Maps. And the best way we found is to have these uh, different uh, sensors work together to figure out what their location is. For that, they need to, uh, to exchange information. The, the second reason to communicate, and that's something that you definitely cannot postpone, is when some of these things get stuck. It happens, right? They, you don't know where they are. They might get into a place where they cannot get away from. And in that case, their information will be lost. But it could be that the information that they have is very unique. It could be that um, these sensors, if they get stuck, that they, by definition, they're in a place where other sensors will never come. And you still want to have that information. So a sensor that gets stuck, um, at the moment, it senses that there is another sensor passing. It transfers all the memory content to the sensor that's passing. And so that's the second situation where you, uh, you need to communicate. This last case actually is, is relatively nice because you know that, well, you, you, you can completely deplete your battery. Right? You, you don't need it for anything else anymore. So there, the power dissipation is not much of a concern. But for the, the localization, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the main research topics, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question is, um, what kind of substance can uh, the SMARBO cross? Uh, you can think of, of gases or, or liquids. Uh, can yeah. you elaborate a little bit on that as well? Yes. So um, the, 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 it works best, we found, if the, the density of the SMARBO is similar to the density of the environment, right? Because then it goes with the flow. It, it follows the, the stream of whatever the surrounding is, because these things do not, at least not at this moment, have independent propulsion. The reason that we don't have propulsion is that the battery doesn't allow that. If you would put in a motor with a, some kind of uh, propeller, then you, know, you would deplete the battery very quickly. So similar density is important. And uh, if you look at the, the, uh, the, the, the balls that we currently are using, I, I can't quickly open this one, but uh, there's actually uh, pieces of lead in there or sand to make it exactly the right density so that it goes with uh, the fluids. And currently we can do um, the, the many of the common fluids, uh, anything that is not, not too far away from water. So water, wastewater, fuels, oils, uh, the, the uh, blood, um, th these kind of things. That, that works quite well. Um, but we are looking at other applications as well. And it could be, for example, that uh, these things will have to work and uh, maybe even in environments where density is not important. Right? So one of the experiments that we are uh, currently discussing is um, experiments in microgravity, uh, where the weight of this thing is not important anymore. So um, yeah, like I also mentioned in the presentation, um, there, there's always new applications that we haven't thought of. And so probably the, the number of environments where we know that it can be used is just a very small subset of where it actually can be used, maybe with some adaptations. Yeah, especially when you think of uh, a nano level uh, to function on. I, 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 I'm not uh, <clears throat> uh, fully convinced that that's possible, but, but maybe that uh, that would be very interesting, uh, especially when it comes to um, investigating the, the internal parts of the body. So yes. what 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 uh, what are, what's the range of sizes that marbles come these days? Yeah, so the the uh, default that we have is uh, 60 millimeters. Uh, okay. We have them at the moment uh, down to 40 at various sizes. Um, and uh, we have uh, one in development that is going to be around 25 millimeters, um, which are all with the standard electronics. The one with the optimized integrated circuits, they will be much less than 10 millimeter. So yeah. they will be in the in millimeter range. And those, um, that seems like uh, it should be possible to swallow them without too much of a uh, hassle. I mean, there, there are things that people already s uh, swallow, right? There are, for example, these camera pills that are used to inspect your, uh, uh, your, your uh, uh, digestive tract. And uh, these things are actually uh, larger than a centimeter, and people find them somewhat hard to swallow, but they still do if, it's, if, if the urgency is high enough. Um, but this could be something that would actually be quite comfortable. Okay, thank you very much. There's a, there's a question from the audience as well. Could uh, artificial intelligence improve the sensor's ability to make more energy efficient or useful measurements? Yes, yeah, and in fact, um, uh, you could consider the evolutionary algorithms that we use uh, as a way, uh, as, as one of a family, uh, of the family of artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, and what they generate is these instincts and these instincts now it's getting a little bit technical, but they, they generate, uh, they're, they're implemented as Bayesian trees. 
Um, so there, there is already um, some, some level of artificial intelligence that is used to optimally use the resources we have. Uh, and we think we can go a lot further <clears throat> in that. But the limitation is that we need to, to balance that, right? So uh, the, the part of the artificial intelligence algorithms, the part that can be offline, that can be in the simulated environment, that is really great. There you have almost unlimited resources and you can now use a large variety of algorithms. But the, the part that actually goes into, especially these really tiny ones that we work, work on that, that are most in need of optimally using power, there these algorithms can only be used if they're also really low power, if they can be implemented very efficiently. So we have to find that balance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how could uh, the sensors be used to address sustainability issues is one of the questions that our online yeah. audience has. That, that's a really interesting one. So um, uh, there, there's uh, sustainability sorry, is a, a very large range of topics, right? Um, for example, uh, I didn't know, but uh, drinking water, a, a lot of that is lost in transport depending on the country. In the Netherlands, I, I think we lose uh, something in the order of maybe 5% or so. Um, in other countries, uh, I, I've been in contact with uh, uh, a water company, water distribution company in the UK. They lose about 20%. Um, if we can quickly and cheaply identify the leaks, uh, where they are, what, 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 and, and allow these repairs, then we already have one step in the direction of sustainability. Um, but there's other applications as well. For example, um, another experiment that we're doing is in industrial processing, right? So if you have um, processes, for example, where you need to uh, do a chemical reaction or you need to uh, do a mixing of fluids or whatever, um, if you can monitor that process very accurately, you can much better optimize the process parameters and you can do the same, uh, get the same result with much less energy, for example. And so there's, there's many applications that if you have access to information about an inaccessible environment, like a chemical process, you can optimize that and improve the sustainability of the, the whole chain uh, one step further. Um, environmental monitoring might be in, in another uh, application. So for example, if you could run these things through the sewers and you could uh, use them to detect where um, toxic substances enter the sewer system, we could, uh, optim we, we could stop it at the source and we could have a much better quality uh, of, uh, of wastewater management. So okay. there's, there's a, a, a large range of, of topics and I'm sure there must be many, many more that I'm not yeah. even aware of. And and that's where the Dutch Design Week comes in handy because then you can explore with a with a wide audience all sorts of uh, of uh, possibilities uh, with your with these marbles. We have uh, time for a for a couple of questions maybe. Um, how do you accommodate for different densities of different liquids, or is this yeah. not necessary due to pressure in the pipelines? Uh, it depends on the application. So there are applications indeed where we have mixtures of fluids and different densities in different places. And th then indeed we have a, a potential problem. So if there's enough pressure, then it will work. If there's not enough pressure, we find that the sensor balls will drag along the, the top or the bottom of the, of the pipe or the environment. And they will at the very least slow down. If they slow down, then we could in principle compensate it by longer battery lifetime and more patience. Um, if they really get stuck, and all of them get stuck, then we uh, really have a serious problem. Um, we have been thinking about potential solutions. We don't have uh, perfect solutions yet. Um, one possible solution is to have uh, a compartment uh, th that's filled with air initially, and there's a small leak, and the air uh, escapes. And then slowly, the density of the ball increases, and hopefully somewhere along the way, it has the right density for that environment. Um, we are also thinking about what you can do if you could spend a little bit of energy on activation. So maybe you can drop some weight at some point or uh, change uh, some kind of bellow uh, settings to, to change the pressure of the gas inside. So there, there are ideas, but very often um, these ideas, they are nice in principle, but when you try to implement them, then you run into limitations in, in size and power dissipation. So we, we have constraints there. And there are probably applications that we cannot do. 
Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Before I ask the last question, I would like to inform the viewers that there will be a link coming up in case you want to use this view for uh, use purposes. So uh, take care of your of your streams and uh, see uh, what you have to fill in. But I have a last question for you, and that's uh, what will be the role of artificial, artif artificial intelligence when it comes to optimizing this marvels? Uh, can you say a little bit about that? I mean, it's uh, of course a very uh, important subject, and it takes a lot yes. of time to explore that. But maybe you can can share a lot of yeah. uh, share a few thoughts. Uh. Yes. Well, artificial intelligence is a field that itself is very much in development. Right. It's, uh, the developments there go very very fast, and and similarly, the technology for smartphones is developing very fast. So it, it's at the moment not quite clear to me which combinations now and in the future will be optimal. Um, nevertheless, we, we really have high hopes of uh, using artificial intelligence, not just for the optimization of the configuration like we're doing now and for optimizing the modeling, but also for, uh, for example, designing optimal circuits. So in my, my own field is, is uh, electronics design. And uh, I've always been dreaming, I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer, right? So inherently I'm lazy. Right? So if you can have a computer do something that otherwise I would have to do myself, that would be great. So yes. why can't we have an artificial intelligence algorithm design these chips and optimize them very accurately for the task at hand? Yeah. Um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons why that's not easy. Um, that's the reason why auto standard autom automation with standard tools uh, like it's used for digital doesn't really work for this kind of data converter and sensors. But maybe artificial intelligence could do something like that because in many ways, uh, the design of these kind of circuits uh, requires not just knowledge, but also some form of experience. And we see that there are some artificial intelligence algorithms that can build up experience. And uh, maybe that's a way towards that kind of, of automation. But that's highly speculative. I mean, I cannot give any guarantees, but I have hopes that maybe um, in the future we can automate so much that I, I might even occasionally have time to look out of the window and think of new problems. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Peter Baltus, um, the, the part of his uh, research can be, can be seen in the website of uh, dw.tua.nl and that will be live uh, after five o'clock this afternoon. Um, so it's a very good opportunity to so see all sorts of interesting technology driven uh, designs uh, as part of the Dutch Design Week online. So I invite everyone to uh, to to visit the, the, the site and to be in contact also with Peter Baltus uh, via that site. So that's a nice opportunity to speculate uh, some more. For now, I would like to round off this uh, program uh, announcing that we have a, a theater play coming up, Vanta Black, that's uh, this Thursday evening. You can follow that online, and maybe there are still some tickets, but I guess it's sold out. But you can indeed follow it online. And then next week, we have Laila Frank uh, explaining the American dream once more. American dream also in relation to the upcoming uh, elections. And in the evening, we have a very interesting program about the Nobel Prize where uh, a lot of um, interesting uh, talks will be around the, the prizes that are um, given this year uh, as part of the Nobel Prizes 2020. So a lot of to a lot to explore in the Studium Generale program. Visit our website, of course, uh, to see the latest news also in relation to the Corona developments. For now, thank you very much for watching us and uh, we'll be there again. Bye-bye, have a good day, and visit the dw.tv.nl. Bye-bye.